Hello, guys. Alex Ferrero here, and today we have a very special guest, a guest with a very particular uh, expertise that will be extremely valuable for uh, a lot of you guys. Like if you're like in e-commerce business, if you drop shipping, and you ever had issues with uh, merchant accounts or holds or payment processors, <laughs> now this is this is your man, um, Travis. Uh, he is VP of uh, business development with Cambridge Commerce. So these guys provide different solutions for uh, e-commerce sellers, for overall like, sellers. And Travis, I'll be learning some insights from you today on kind of like how to scale, right? Because the way I think about it, like, first of all, like, thank you for making the time. I know you're a very busy man. Here. I, it's kind of like at the end of the day, right? Like, for example, our audience, like e-commerce entrepreneurs and, and jobs, like you might figure out like all of the things in terms of how to sell your products. But then at the end of the day, like your money ends up on the merchant account, and you know, with a payment processor, right? And, and, and at the end of the day, like they pretty much own you in some way, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, effectively, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, man, like what's, I mean, a lot of the people that are listening, they're, they're using like Shopify. Uh, what do you think about like standard options like that available to sellers, like Shopify payments, for example? Yeah. So I think there's, there's a, what's great about Shopify or even like PayPal or some of these integrated uh, Amazon pay or, or some of these different functionalities that are built right in within Shopify store are fantastic in the ease of use. It's easy to set up. It's easy to get started. You know, and if you're just starting out, there's low, you know, it's not like you've got like this big three-year contract that you've got to sign and minimum fees or any of that kind of stuff. Like it's so simple. They make it so easy and it's all in integrated. So I have a lot of respect for what they've built and it's a great solution for a lot of guys. And I think starting out, it's, it's really easy to kind of get your feet wet in a simple way because it's very intuitive on how to set up and, and use. So I, I think that's a, it's a great option and there's a need for it in the market and the way they built it out, I think are, are fantastic payment solutions, honestly. And yeah. over, after some time, right? So let's say you have a business that you started out with Shopify payments. A lot of the people, you know, cause I'm in like different e-commerce groups, they might yeah. face, you know, like limitations. They might face, you know, the um, holds, reserves, stuff like that. Is that actually like normal, like to have like reserves, to have holds on the merchant account? Is that just part of doing the business? It, it can be. Um, Here's what a lot of people don't realize is effectively a merchant account relationship is almost like, almost like a credit line, if you will, like a, like a, like a financial relationship. So think of it in the terms of there's some risk or liability to the bank that you're, that's processing your transaction. Because at the end of the day, if you have disputes or chargebacks or things happen and people are asking for refunds or demanding it through a chargeback, ultimately the bank is on the hook for facilitating those transactions for you. When it comes to reserves or holds or those kind of things, it really depends um, on your specific business as far as what your refund rates are, what your chargeback rates are. And if you're setting up an account and you don't have that, that understanding of, of what the risk is from their perspective. So, I mean, think about it, you know, you have legitimate businesses doing drop shipping or, or whatever they're doing for, you know, selling products online on a Shopify store or whatever. But how do you differentiate real businesses from fraudsters? And a, and a processor may not know if it's a real business or a fraudster until they've got thousands of transactions that have run through. Um, and you know, while there's, there are some protections, there's some automated underwriting things that Stripe does. They're really designed for these new companies to get up and get going. When you have, um, when you've grown or you've scaled a little bit, there's some additional options that begin to open themselves up to you to allow you to have the better pricing, um, maybe work with, with tools or functionality that, you know, if you're moving off of a Shopify store, if you wanted to work into it, like with a funnel, or, you know, even one click upsells like a nice little funnel, but it also opens the door for you to, to use your own dedicated merchant account. And that, and that allows you to get better pricing and better rates on processing. If you have a good, rel relatively clean business from a history standpoint, you know, low refunds, low chargebacks, that kind of thing. So the fees could actually be lower like than, than what like Shopify, for example, offers. Yeah. So what a lot of people don't realize is um, one of the things Shopify does uh, to merchants, if they wanted to use an outside payment processor, a big portion of their revenue comes in from the fees on the merchant processing accounts with Stripe. Mm -hmm. So they, they provide this platform, but what they're really, they're, they're providing that platform so that they can receive income from the payment processing. One of the things that, that, that they did not that, that long ago is they, they took the Zipify one-click upsell and they put it native into the platform. 
And what, what the one click upsell does is it, it actually doesn't use the Shopify checkout functionality. It, it redirects it to a separate checkout flow outside of Shopify. And that separate checkout flow allows you to connect your own gateway and merchant account, mm-hmm. but it doesn't penalize you. Cause if you, if you do it, set up your own merchant account directly in Shopify, they'll penalize you. I think almost close to 1% yeah. on your processing. So it kind of wipes out the entire savings, but this one click upsell redirect allows you to completely maintain all the tools that you utilize in Shopify, but it gives you access to doing up, upsell funnels and flows and use your own dedicated merchant account and not be penalized the rate. One click upsell charges for something, right? They charge their own fees. Only on upsells. So if you don't have any upsells handle them through that, then there's no, there's not really a fee. I think there's like a, like a $99 a month or something, something super nominal. So that's yeah. pretty much kind of like an alternative to funnels in some way. And it's a, it's a basic funnel, right? It's not phenomenal. It, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that some of these other systems do, but it, it's native and it's simple. And so like, that's a very easy step to begin to explore how to begin to build funnels into your campaigns and your offers. Cause you will, you will increase your average order value when you offer those types of, of services or, or delivery of that type of offer in that way. And then we work with a lot of other companies. If you're, if they're doing something outside of, you know, Shopify or for example, you know, uh, something like sticky or connective or some of these other more sophisticated CRMs opens up a whole <laughs> plethora of more options for you. So it really kind of depends on, on where processing, right? Like, yeah. Uh, not only on processing, but the complexity of how you can design the funnel itself and um, the conversion rates, you can see a lot higher conversion rate if you design the funnels well. Um, but it, it does take a little bit more time. It's not as intuitive. And so, you, you know, you, you need to work with a tech team where you may not need to do that on a Shopify store. Do you see that kind of like natural progression that people, like a lot of people kind of like evolve and then change the platforms? That's what I've seen at least. And, and look, you can grow a huge store on, on Shopify. So don't get me wrong from that perspective. Mm-hmm. There's some functionalities in there and it depends on, you know, if you're just doing simple products, you know, Shopify, the Shopify store is more than enough. But if you're getting a little bit more sophisticated in how you're engaging your customers, retention, new offers, promoting things, um, re-engaging them, bringing them through, you know, flows of orders, having something that, that can handle, that's a little bit more robust to handle that, um, connecting it with email marketing, um, designing the, you know, the customer journey, if you will. And so you can kind of map that out a little bit more. It allows you to be a lot more profitable if you structured it properly. Cool. For the, um, that's like topic that a lot of people, so some people had their like merchant accounts shut down, right? <laughs> Sometimes I laugh. I'm sorry. It's just so mean. <laughs> but yes, it's it's one of those like, big big pain points, you know. Because if you do, if that happens, then pretty much your your whole business, like if it's not structured properly before that point, then mm-hmm. it stops right until you figure out the you know the new setup. So why that happens, right? And so you work with many clients, kind of like what are the most like frequent reasons that happens? Is that only for like legitimate reasons? Like for example, <laughs> so high yeah. ratio, or it's also happens just like because you use the same CRM as like other shady sellers or like how is that working out from your experience? That's a great question. I think, um, cause, cause one of the challenges, this happens all the time. Like I'll, I'll have, you know, I'm in different Facebook groups and, and I'll see, you know, people freak out because something happens. Right. And they're like, they just, they don't know what, why they got shut down. They're like, we've been processing. We thought, you know, we had the account set up. It was approved. We haven't changed anything. And then all of a sudden it feels like out of nowhere, they got slapped. The thing about uh, Shopify and PayPal and a lot of these services, the value that they have is speed to market. So you're able to get up and quick and it's, it's very simple. Mm-hmm. Um, but the downside to that is that nobody's actually looking at your website. They're not really underwriting your business. They're just, does it pass these criteria set up in the account in an automated way? I've heard, so, I heard and yeah. if you will, I don't know if that's like a problem. I had a conversation with an entrepreneur and he's in that like payment processing, but like in Europe space. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, said, he said that they launched, I, I don't know how, how to do that, like, but he said, I'll have to Google it. But it said that Shopify launch, launched the, um, uh, I think, Shopify payments and, mm-hmm. Shopify, and Shopify loans at the same, uh, on the same day. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Oh, wow. That, that would make a lot of sense. So whatever like, funds they have on hold, now they can... They can borrow these funds, you know, with interest. <laughs> but I don't know. I have to. I'll have to Google it. I don't know. That's I mean, it depends on how far down the conspiracy trails you want to get to. <laughs> so, yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a business model, but I don't know about that specifically. But what I will say is this is it's hard sometimes for a business to really understand, like you're, you're trying to figure out your marketing, you're trying to figure out your operations, you're trying to figure out, you know, your products and all that kind of stuff. Having somebody that you can talk to that really understands payments is a huge asset. If you're, if you're really trying to grow and scale, because you don't really know what you don't know. I'll see people where they're selling supplements and they're running and everything's going fine. And then all of a sudden they get their account turned off because in their, and it depends on how they're doing it, like with Square or Stripe or some of these different groups, like they do this automated process because the, the truth is like a lot of times people set up and they just don't do anything. So why spend the time underwriting all these different accounts? Let's just automate it. And when they start processing sales, now let's look at it and we'll do the due diligence and underwrite it. I see. Um, if that's the case, if you kind of have a business that's up and scaling and, and maybe you're in a category that isn't welcomed with open arms, like you're doing supplement sales, right? So nutraceuticals is like a category that's restricted or prohibited sometimes with a lot of processors, or you're doing some sort of phone sales, or you're doing, um, you know, subscription continuity, or even negative option or membership, different categories of products. Like there's, there's all kinds of different things. Most of the time they want retail stores and they don't really want direct response marketers. So when you start having direct response, you tend to have a little bit higher chargeback ratios. You tend to have issues that come up from that perspective. And um, it's not uncommon for, uh, for the category of the product to be something that they don't really want, but they auto approved it. And so now people scramble when they get an account shut down because it was a category that probably shouldn't have been approved, but they approved it anyway, because it's just an automation. I see. Um, yeah. For example, working with like someone like yourself, um, like, so you, you guys, I mean, the whole kind of like review process is first, right? Before you- yeah. Absolutely. So we spend a little bit of time on the front end. Um, I've been at Cambridge for 20 years now. So, you know, we've, we've been, we've always been in the direct response space. I love that space. I, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, getting an offer direct to consumers and, and it's, it's about the math and the metrics and, you know, does everything kind of line up? And if it does, you can continue to scale and keep ramping. It's just, it's a, it's a way more fun area of business to, to play in. And I see a lot more success in that consistently than you see sometimes in a lot of retail stores. Um, you, you know, it's easier to scale. There's a lot fewer limitations when it comes to it, but the limitations that you generally have are going to be media from my perspective, media and merchant processing. Mm -hmm. And so if you have those two things dialed down, you can usually grow or scale the support, the fulfillment, the product, the inventory, like all of those types of things are, are much more scalable in direct response, but mids and media or payment processing and media tend to be bottlenecks sometimes. And so, you know, looking, knowing what to look at, knowing, you know, do I have a product that has really been underwritten and appropriate for the bank and processing that I'm doing. Once you usually scale beyond about hundred thousand dollars a month in sales, they actually have to go through uh, their own due diligence, whether it's Stripe or PayPal, they, there's a, they're, they're an aggregator of payment processor. So it's really PayPal's merchant account. And then you're, you have a sub account underneath them, but it's their merchant account. They're the merchant of record. So this under those requirements, they don't really have to do due diligence or underwriting until you reach a certain threshold of volume. And then it's just like any other merchant account. So they'll, they'll, ask for, sometimes they'll ask for financial statements. Sometimes they'll ask for customer audits or they'll reach out to the customers and make sure they're getting product. You know, those types of things pop up. So we do that all on the front end. And we also, you know, I, I tend to be a little bit more consultative with clients. You know, we, we were at a conference, Alex, right? And talking about all kinds of different stuff. You throw anything on the table and happy to answer those questions. But it gives a little bit of insight because I understand the way that the banks think and work. You know, that's kind of my background before Cambridge was in finance, mm -hmm. um, leasing and lending and that kind of thing. And so I understand the way that bankers think, but I love direct response marketing. And so when you can kind of marry those things, you understand what the risks and the challenges are from the banker perspective, but then also in understanding what the needs are of direct response marketers. It's like, yeah. And so, so now you can kind of figure out the path to navigate through to really find success in, in both of those areas. So, you know, one of the things people talk about sometimes or are concerned about is, or don't understand, it's like, like, this is a perfect example. I give this one all the time, which is, you know, say a, a processor, Stripe or PayPal or whoever, any processor puts a hold on the account. And it's very natural if you can get a hold of somebody and sometimes you can't, but if you can actually talk to somebody and you talk to them and you're like, Hey, whoever the risk manager is, you, know, you guys are putting a hold on my account. I need those funds to pay for media, for inventory, for payroll, for, right. So I really need you to release those funds. Um, and usually it's not that polite, but, <laughs> but sometimes it is. And the thing is, when you say that to a risk manager, all they heard was, I can't pay. Oh. In that circumstance, if they can't pay, if you can't pay any of those things, 
How are you going to be able to pay the processing fees? How are you going to handle chargebacks that may come in? How are you going to handle any of that? So rather than let go of that money and give it back to you, they're going to hang on even tighter to it. Wow. And, and it's, it's a natural thing to think of, right? So it's completely normal process to think of, but it's absolutely the wrong thing to do. Yeah. And so a more, the, the best way to handle something like that, if there's a hold and you can actually talk to a real person, because that's really the key is like, if you can talk to a real person, you can kind of negotiate what they're, exactly. yeah, what their concern is, right? And the thing is for that specific thing, if they're holding funds on your account, it means they have a concern. And so your job at that point is to help them address their own concern so they can take it off the box and let go of the money for you. I'll tell clients all the time, like, you know, reach out to them and just, just say, Hey, thank you so much uh, for taking my call. I see that you guys have some questions. Maybe you're, you want to understand what we're doing. We're, we're here to help you. What can we get you that'll help you make that decision? Because it's not confrontational and you're helping them do their job so they can tick the box and move it past. Yeah. It typically it's like, you bastards, right? Like, <laughs> I know, right? So these poor people, they get yelled at all day long. And so to get a call where it's polite, respectful, helpful, <laughs> what can I do to help this guy? Hey guys, uh, people have been asking me how we scale to multiple six figures or even seven figures per month without getting shut down on Facebook. And we have a very sophisticated solution for this that I want to share with you, but it's, it's just like too valuable to give away for free. So if you guys want this solution, just book a call with one of my team members and we'll show you exactly what it is and how it works and we'll see if that's a good fit uh, for you and for your business. So just book a call with my team member, we'll share it with you so you can scale your business to multiple six figures or even seven figures per month without getting shut down on Facebook, without having inconsistency and with high profitability. So just book a call with my team and I'll see you there. Would you say like, hey, I have to pay taxes or no? <laughs> I don't say any obligation or any expense that you have. Yes, it's legitimate, but it's not their concern. Their concern is, are you going to be stable? Can you handle? And if we release some money, can, are, are we going to have a problem? Or are you going to take care of your customers? Wow, that's such a good, because, yeah, wow. I, I remember we had like holding one of our accounts and like I provided them, you know, the statements from the bank account. Yep. And I said like, hey, you know, we, we have you know, sufficient amount of like funds on our ad accounts, you know, so because that's all they're really concerned about. They're concerned about from a risk perspective. These are people who don't make a ton of money. Right. And they get yelled at or reprimanded if they make the wrong decision. But if they, you know, if they like, if they lose money, right. Mm -hmm. So the stripe loses money, their manager yells at them is pissed off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cause they made the bad decision, but they don't get any credit. They don't get any attaboys. They don't get any raises for releasing money back to you. They have one job. Don't lose money for the company. Wow. That's what the risk mentality is. And so as soon as you begin to understand people's role, like um, Josh uh, Snow, right? Um, I heard him speak one time and he was talking about one of the best things that you can do is understand how everybody gets paid, right? So whether it's your attorney, like what, what, what's the payoff for them? Your employees, your uh, different vendors you work with, like how do they get paid? Like what, what's the, the currency that, they're, that they value, right? Sometimes it's money, fine. Sometimes it's prestige. Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes it's networking up. You know, there's all different ways to get paid for the risk people just to make sure that, they, that there's not a loss. Right. So understanding like what the way they get paid, they don't get yelled at. <laughs> that's a good day for them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. That's such a, such a great perspective on, in terms of Stripe. And, you know, we talked, we talked about that, like previously, you said that they probably have one of the most like, one of the clearest explanations of the dispute oh. like, and those kind of like, some kind of like the benchmarks that like you don't want to overstep. Right. So, so let me do this. Can I paint a picture for how the payment processing industry works? Cause okay. I think a lot of people, okay. I think a lot of people get confused about it. Cause they think like it's some giant financial institution, like some big bank or something. Uh -huh. And I, th I think the easiest way to understand how the actual structure of merchant processing works is to think of it more like McDonald's. And, and what I mean by that is a lot of people think, you know, like I said, it's, it's a big bank, but McDonald's is actually not in the business of selling hamburgers. McDonald's is in the business of doing the marketing and writing the rules for how hamburgers are made under their brand. And then underneath that marketing and brand, what they do is they take in franchise owners. So they have a bunch of different franchise owners who might have a, several stores. And in the payment processing world, Visa and MasterCard are like McDonald's. The franchise owners would be like the sponsor or member banks, like the Wells Fargo's, the Fifth Thirds, the, you know, Chase, the wh whoever, Bank of America. Yeah. There's a bunch of member banks or franchise owners. And then they have a bunch of store locations. And so Stripe's a store location, Humboldt Merchant Services is a store location, Chase Payment Tech is a store location. So they're, they're branches that you can go to or there are store locations where you can buy the hamburger, if you will. And then usually you have 
some sales rep or some guy at the counter taking an order. And so sometimes it's an automated machine, like you punch in your order or online, and sometimes it's a real person. And usually that sales rep works directly for that location. And so the role that Cambridge is like, we're actually a sales rep at the counter effectively. Like that's really what our role is taking orders. But we work with about 20 different locations or banks that have different access to different membership or sponsor banks to the visa processing. So just like at McDonald's, if you wanted to get spam and eggs at McDonald's or noodles, you can't just go to every location to get it. But if you want, if you wanted to get that and you go to the right guy and he's like, Hey, you can't get it here. But if you go here and here and here, they'll support exactly what you're doing and what you're looking for. So that's, that's the role that Cambridge plays in that whole hierarchy or structure. And I think it's just kind of helpful to, for people to understand. It's like, okay, here's how this works. And so the thing is like, everybody has to follow the rules of Visa MasterCard, right? Basically you don't do anything illegal. <laughs> okay. And then each franchise has like their own sub rules within that, that they're comfortable with. Like we do all, only retail stores and this other location does e-commerce, but no subscription or no supplements or, you know, whatever. And so they kind of carve out things that, that they've taken losses on. There's a saying like every warning signs written in somebody's blood. <laughs> and it's basically like, you know, don't swim with sharks, you know, don't, don't swim here. Sharks, shark attacks or the sharks are around here, or coral or whatever. Um, but in the banking world, they have, you know, they have their own rules and, and they write prohibited lists or restricted lists based on losses that they've taken. So I, so I kind of change that saying a little bit to every prohibited list is written in somebody's loss. You know, some bank took a loss on BizOp and they're like, no more BizOp. <laughs> oh, <laughs> or, oh, I see. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So those, those normally get updated from time to time. But, um, and, and a, a lot of things like people don't realize, like they, this is one of the things with like, really most contracts and entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs tend to not read through the fine print of everything. And so there's these long contracts that usually reference these other documents. So Visa and MasterCard have like 200 page document of rules for how you're supposed to handle payments. Wow. And, and when you sign your agreement or you click on the submit button for Stripe or PayPal, you agree to those terms that you never even knew were there. I mean, it's like no one reads them anyway. Like, <laughs> nah, I do. Like, oh, you, you do. Wow. Yeah. But, but you're right. Nobody reads that stuff. And so part of it is, and I'm not saying that you should, because there's so many rules it's like, and they get updated every year and it's well, right. Like, I mean, boom, like they might change like tomorrow or like next month. Yeah. It's so, so every year they update them. It's hard to keep on track of. You've got all these other things that are stealing your attention and time and energy. Do you really need to do that? But at the same time, if you don't know the rules, how are you going to win the game? So that's one of the things that I like. I really enjoy having time to educate people about some of the different rules and how to navigate through what those challenges are to find a way to win, you know, cause, cause there are ways to play the game in a way that's, that's long-term sustainable, build success, um, and still compliant with the rules. That's what I, I really enjoy doing that. I really enjoy helping entrepreneurs figure out how to play within the rules that they're doing, address the challenges that could come up, think about strategies that, that will mitigate that or protect them or from, the downside and give them all the benefit of the upside. Mm. Wow. So for the chargeback ratios, right? That's mm. probably as well, like one of the things that entrepreneurs should have in mind, right? Like, so yes, no the rules. Yeah. 0 0.9, right. Is, is the benchmark that you don't want to kind of like over. Yeah. So, so if you, if you just Google, um, uh, Stripe chargeback monitoring program, they have the cleanest presentation of what the rules are when it comes to chargeback and ratios and what's allowed. You can get the same information from Visa MasterCard directly in those 200 page documents. It's there. It's just, so, so for example, like Stripe kind of like Stripe reflects exactly the same sense as Visa and MasterCard directly. Correct. Because again, Visa and MasterCard write the rules and everybody has to play by the rules of Visa and MasterCard, right? Same hamburger. <laughs> so when you see the rules there, it's the same rules that every other processor has to follow. And it's basically, they look at from chargebacks. So let's talk about that for a second, because um, yeah, we can talk about chargebacks a little bit, but, but um, basically the rule is that if you have more than a hundred chargebacks on Visa, and I'm going to just talk about Visa because Visa and MasterCard are separate, but Visa says if you have more than a hundred chargebacks in a month and you also have more than point, um, 0.9% chargeback ratio, looking at chargebacks this month compared to sales this month. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you exceed both of those thresholds, they consider you to have excessive chargebacks. Mm -hmm. And what happens is if you stay in that range for more than four months, on the fourth month, you get a fine. 
So but when Stripe, not necessarily. Mm-hmm. I think with Stripe, like they might like, start probably like if you're like a new merchant, they they might just shut down your account. One hundred percent. They don't play like maybe with these other like. So you said it's four months because I said it's like okay if you are step like that's a game over, but it's not game over, right? You still have the chance to fix it. You do, and and the thing is, yes, you do have the chance to fix it, but they may or may not allow you the time to fix it. Mm. It's it's Stripe's decision or the processor you're with, whoever you're processing with, it's their decision if they're going to allow you to work through that or not. And we can talk about chargebacks in a minute if if you have some more time. But but um, understanding again what that rule is, um, it allows you to to know okay, that's what their concern is because at the end of the day, regardless of your ability to pay fees or fines the processor is obligated ultimately to Visa and MasterCard. If any of the merchants that they have get a fine, they're responsible for it. So if the merchant goes out of business or doesn't pay it or doesn't cover chargebacks, they're handling it. It's their cost and their loss because that's part of the rules that Visa and MasterCard have. So they've got a risk. And so that's why I'm saying at the beginning of our conversation, like think of them like a, like a line of credit because they're trying to manage their risk. They don't want to take any losses on their loans, if you will, um, for your business. Wow, this is crazy. So... Typically, like, what is kind of like when, when merchant processors, for example, so, okay, so what is, when, when these companies, right, merchant processors, they're working with, like, directly, let's say, with Visa, Visa, MasterCard, how much, like, what is their margin typically? Like, how much is, <laughs> you know, I mean, could, there could be, like, a range, probably, like, but let's say, so if Stripe makes, like, 2.9%, uh, I think 2.9 and, like, 30 cents per transaction, like, what is it cost like? Yeah. So here's what's kind of funny is because um, they'll charge a flat fee, right? For pretty much everything except for maybe like a, like international transactions. I think they have a surcharge of like 1% or something. So the thing is with card brands, um, Visa and MasterCard actually publish what's called interchange. And interchange is the whole, it's effectively it's a wholesale cost. So when, you're, when you look at a credit card, your bank gives you a credit card. The reason they give you a credit card is because they want you to use that credit card because every time you do, they receive interchange payment, basically. So they get, they get um, a small percentage of your transaction as credit to them for you using your card. So the bank that gave you the card gets money back every time you use it. And that's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why you get a higher level reward card. Those, those cards have a higher cost that, that merchants pay as part of the interchange cost that goes back to the consumer, right? So if you get like a one point back, 1% back, so how they cover that is by, by interchange, charging interchange. Okay. So it's like the wholesale cost. Let's say you have like, okay, so just make sure I understand correctly. Let's say you have like a MasterCard. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what you just said means that let's say, let's say my MasterCard is issued by Bank of America. Yep. So Bank of America, every time I use that MasterCard, like makes money on that. Yes. Oh, okay. But like, let's say I buy in the store. So that means that merchant uh, in the store pays the fees, right? So yes, yes. That's, that's most common historically how it's been done. There's a change recently that's happening that allows merchants to pass that on to consumers. Oh, really? um, and so, so you can actually do that and it's a bit like a little surcharge. You can do it online. You can do it in store. Yeah. It's some, becoming more common. For some services and then they say, Hey, if you're paying by credit card, like there's extra 3% subcharge or something. Mm-hmm. But if you want to pay by cash, no problem. Or debit card, it's lower. So the thing is, interchange is that cost. That's what drives the, the fees for your processing. And they range anywhere from on a low, low side, like debit cards, it's like 0.05% and uh, 20 cents a transaction. Like that would be the low end of interchange. I mean, that's like nothing. Right, you're paying three percent basically, and they're charging 005 percent on the fees. So there's a credible margin when it comes to that. So on, Stripe would make like zero five. <laughs> that's on on debit cards, on debit cards, and so um, not all debit cards. There's there's a lot of different things, but there's there's basically interchange is like nine hundred plus categories. Basically, they have things for like grocery stores, they have things for retail stores, they have fees for e-commerce. So the, the type of store, gas stations, insurance, and then they also have um, fees for you know specific type of cards, reward cards, business cards, commercial cards, debit cards, credit cards, right? So there's all these different categories of interchange. And so blended in what I typically see when I look at statements, depends what your customer makeup is. It depends if they're using debit cards or credit cards, but usually on e-commerce, what I typically see 
is about half of their transactions are debit cards because consumers will use a credit card, a debit card, just like a credit card. Um, and so about half their transactions are debit cards and half their transactions are, are normal credit cards or high level reward cards. And so on the high end interchange could be, you know, three, 3.8% for like international, uh-huh. whatever, but all in, I see that it usually the total cost of interchange is probably around 1.9 to maybe 2.2%. Okay. And so on the rest, for example, Stripe, that would be their margin. That's what they would be. Exactly. Right. So and it, sometimes it depends on the ticket size, right? Because the smaller the transaction amount, like you have a $2 transaction, um, you might have a 30 cent transaction fee, yeah. right? So now the rate, if the effective rate is going to be really high. But if you have a $100 transaction and a 30 cent fee, it's like, pff, that's nothing. Wow. Such an interesting, like... Okay, so in terms of the trends, right? Like, and where where this is going? So you've been this. You said like in this industry, like twenty years, right? Uh, what happened? Like, okay, so let's say it's like year two thousand like one. Right? How the industry was functioning? Like, like you could do anything. Like, you know, a lot of people would do like the trials and stuff, and would make you know a lot of money with it. Was that kind yeah. of like? It was, well, okay. So my, my experience was I came from more of like the as seen on TV infomercials, direct response type of space, like nice. way back when. So what I kind of, what I appreciate about the time that I had and in, in like the space that I was in at the time is um, I'm a big believer that, that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it has a tendency to rhyme. And so I look at the direct response as seen on TV space as almost like the grandfather of modern internet marketing, right? Cause you had, the, these entrepreneurs who would just jump in, they'd throw things up on TV and things would work and they'd make money and whoo, right. But uh-huh. they had to figure out because the systems weren't always there. It wasn't super easy. So they're plugging these things together to, to try to figure it out, but they're entrepreneurial to their core. Right. And they're willing to take risks and they'll come out with products like a lot of the gadget stuff that we see today. I mean, hello, <laughs> like that's all the, as seen on TV and commercial stuff. But what, it, what I saw in that space is I saw the trial offers. I saw all the normal things develop. Um, because they're testing, they're testing offers, they're seeing what works. And so in the early days, they throw anything on. And then as it began to mature, online became available more and more popular. And, and they used to have all their phone, all their sales over the phones. And then it was like 90% of their sales over the phone and 10% online. And then that grew to 50, 50. And now it's like 80% online and, you know, 20% over the phones. But as you see that develop, what's, what also happened in that space is, is I saw this consolidation of bigger players. You had like the the major players like the Telebrands or Idea Village or some of these larger as seen on TV branded companies, product lines, QVC, um, Pet Egg. QVC, you know? QVC. Yeah, QVC, yeah, all of that stuff, right? So, but but more in the like smaller products, like the things that you go to, like you go to retail stores and you see them on end caps and it's like as seen on TV, right? And there's like these end caps and stuff. What happened in that space is there was consolidation around the bigger players because what they figured out, they, they always used to do marketing on a metric called MER media efficiency ratio. So if I spent $100 in marketing on, on television ads and I got $200 back in sales, that was a two MER, a two media efficiency ratio. That's like so, right now it's ROAS, right? We're- exactly, yeah. So, so they would look at that metric and what they figured out is that they could actually lose money on TV, the bigger players, because they built relationships to get distribution on retail stores. Huh. So it never existed before, but as they figured that out, they could lose money. So now there was this barrier to entry because it, you couldn't run it out profitably because they're buying up all the media, blasting yeah. products out so they can get them into the retail stores. They just outbid you to buy all of the space they can. Yeah, so, so it made it really hard for new people with good ideas to enter the market. So as that matured, like the margins began to get tighter, right? People had to get more efficient. It was harder for new people to just figure it out and just to make money. Mm-hmm. So I kind of see those things as like, that's kind of like the history, a little bit of like the DRTV space. And so looking at the internet space, I kind of see that similar, different, because it's not going to be the same, but you, I think you, you still have this consolidation of bigger players, people who have brands, you know, we see this at some of the masterminds we're in where, you know, they start off with one product and then they buy another company and they buy another company and they kind of cross market between their companies to, to fortify it. And that's kind of similar. So, so now you can afford to do things because you have scale that you couldn't do when you started, you're more efficient in your, in your, uh, profitability. You've got, you know, your operating costs for your normal offices. And now you have this brand and you have that brand and now you're cross marketing because now it's lower cost of media to acquire those customers. You know, so, so as you get more sophisticated, like those things, you have to get more and more efficient. And what, 
naturally happens is as you do that, as a, as, you know, as you grow in your sophistication, as you grow in your systems and complexity, it makes it harder for new people to come in if they don't have those systems and structures, if they don't understand how to do that, because all these other companies now are beginning to take advantage of those, those scale and those opportunities from what they've learned right over the years. So now you, you have to coming in and I'm not saying this is the case right now, but I'm saying that's, I see that's what's happened in the TV space. So I guarantee you that's what's going to be happening eventually in the online space. It, it just as it matures. So, um, so I've seen that trend and, and that's been a lot of fun to kind of watch that, but also it gives you a little bit of insight into how companies today need to continue to be very, very focused and intentional on increasing their profitability, increasing their ability to maximize what they have, get it more efficient. Um, this is why in the early days of like the trial offer stuff, especially you were guys making tons of money, right? Cause there wasn't a lot of competition and they kind of figured it out. And so now there's a lot more competition out there online because there's all kinds of different people selling all kinds of different products. Um, but in those early days you had, it was like the wild, wild West. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people were just, you know, throw anything up. And, um, and in fact, merchant processing back then used to be super simple. Like you would have companies increasing, you know, they'd start off with like a hundred thousand dollars in sales. They go to like two, two fifty, you know, 400, 500, a half a million, um, you know, three quarters of a million, a million, a million and a half. And right about a million and a half to 3 million to begin to plateau from the marketing. Mm -hmm. And what happened there is in the early days of trial, like as they were exponentially growing quickly, they were fine. But as they plateaued off, what happened is like they had this chargebacks issues coming that was masked by the growth. And, and so when the, oh. yes. So when they plateaued out, this massive wage of chargebacks just came crashing over them. And then they'd be in monitoring programs. And so processors in the early days would just let that run. Cause like, wow, this is growing good for the business. Yay. And then when they saw these losses come in, you know, they started <laughs> and it was big fines. It was like 50 to a hundred dollars a fine per chargeback over a hundred for visa. So if you're like, you know, if you've got a thousand chargebacks, it's a big fine potentially. And then they multiply that fine by the percentage. So if you're at half a percent, no big deal. You're at 5%. It's like a $500 fee per chargeback that they were charging back then. Wow. So I mean, it, and again, if the company went out of business, the processor was on the hook for it. Wow. So that's where you have a lot of these processors. They, they can be a little bit gun shy on these aggressive offers or rapid growth because they don't want to get into that position. They've, they've had that experience before in the trial offer days, you know, supplements and skincare and all that stuff. And so they're, they're much more conservative now from, from that perspective. Wow. So who, okay. So, and Visa and MasterCards, right? Mm-hmm. Because Visa and MasterCard pretty much like they, they set the rules of the game, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Can I tell you how, would, okay. how would that like affect them, right? Okay, so mer like let's say processor is processing the payments, obviously. So processor makes, making some money, like, but at the end of the day, like if, if there's some loss, processor mm -hmm. makes it. So, and, and, and Visa and MasterCard. So what does Visa care, right? Like why would they care, right? Yeah. So back in like 2007, eight. They didn't, they didn't care at all. Like before that, but what ended up happening is um, there was a Senator, Senator Rockefeller back in, I think it was 2008. And he, and he penned a legislation in Congress eventually called the restore online consumer confidence act, ROSCA for short. But what <laughs> I laugh a little bit, sorry, but what the marketers were doing back then is you might throw an ad up for something like pe people are on Fandango, they're buying movie tickets, right. Huh. And they're getting ready to head out. And you would have advertisers who would then do a pop-up to like, say something like click cancel to, to enroll in our program. <laughs> okay. So people aren't really paying attention. They cancel. But then what happened is that website would pass the information on to this other company and they'd start getting subscriptions without really opting into it properly wow. acknowledging. So super aggressive, super wow. aggressive, but it, that was called third-party data pass. And what happened is one of these senators, like his wife or mom or somebody got enrolled into one of these things and he was on a rampage. And so he actually had Senate hearings calling in Visa and MasterCard and asking him, what, what are you doing to protect consumers online? Here's these practices that are really happening. And, and really when they came into the Senate hearings, their answers were like, uh, they didn't have an answer. Wow. So they, list, they looked completely ridiculous. And so some new legislation got passed and there's a bunch of stuff. And there was a big, I, I want to say this was around 2009, 
maybe that that happened, but this was like a huge wave. Tons of merchant accounts got closed down that were doing trial offers or subscriptions or third-party data pass, passing it from one company to another without the consumer's authorization or consent. So, so they closed because of the pressure from like Visa and MasterCard? Well, f- so Visa and MasterCard had pressure from Congress, right? Because you, you, it's on you to protect consumers online. Uh-huh. And, and so then they looked stupid and felt embarrassed. And so then they made this big push to write new rules that specifically address some of those practices. Does he still have that pressure? There is some, so like things, you don't really see this anymore or as much, but negative option billing, which is like, do nothing and be charged, right? So buy our product. 30 day trial, for example, right? Is that it? Yeah. So there's a difference between opting in. Yes, please enroll me and subscribe me to this product versus by, by buying this product, you're automatically enrolled, do nothing and we'll charge you until you die, you know, or you cancel or you can charge back. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Like with all of this, right? Are there companies still doing the trial like model? There are. Um, that is, yeah. So I'm not a fan of that space. I never really have been because in my opinion, a lot of the thing about the trial offer. So I'm going to take a side sidestep and come back if that's okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to talk about chargebacks for just a second because I think it's really important because a lot of people think that, you know, chargebacks is cost of doing business it's, it's just part of how things are. And if I have high chargebacks, what can I do about it? You know, consumers, they're stupid or, you know, whatever. sometimes it's true. They are. Yeah. But what I've learned is very rarely do you have real fraud taking place. Real fraud being you have a, a ring of fraudsters who have a bunch of stolen cards and they're hitting different websites to try to validate cards or, or run transactions through. Sometimes it happens. I'm not saying it doesn't. There's, it absolutely does happen. But what I most often see, especially with direct response, is the, the main thing that drives chargebacks is mismanaged customer expectations. If you want to get a free course on transitioning from drop shipping to eight-figure e-commerce brands and also on scaling e-commerce businesses with high profitability, there should be a link below. Apply, just fill your information. You will also get uh, access to the private community of six, seven, and eight uh, figure entrepreneurs. Now, this link is only for people who already do at least $30,000 per month or more in sales and want to scale their sales, want to scale their profitability, want to avoid bad ad account issues. So if that's you, just apply for that. Uh, There should be a link in the description. Click on it, get free resources. It's completely free of charge and you'll get a lot of value out of it. So make sure you click, get access, and let's get back to the video. So... I go to wherever Walmart and I buy a product and I walk away and you know, 295 check out 295. Everything's exactly as expected. Why on earth would I dispute that? If I go in and if you don't like it, like just come back and return, just come back. No big deal. Right. But if I come in and I had a chance to feel it and all this stuff, right. But if I, if I were to go to Walmart and I bought that same thing for 295, I walk out and then every day I keep getting charged 295. What what the heck's happening? Right. It would, it would be not what I expected. And so I would absolutely be pissed off and feel like I was something happening that this shouldn't be happening. If you understand, you know, in the same thing, like try this at home, you know, I, my wife calls me, Hey honey, uh, dinner's going to be tonight at six. Great. See you there. That's her expectation. 615 rolls around, 630 rolls around. If I'm still working. Okay. <laughs> you better not do that. That's right. <laughs> but it, it's such a simple concept is managing your customer's expectations. And I get why a lot of direct response, like, you know, I'll hire clients and uh, say, look, uh, it doesn't convert as well, right? If I, if I do this, I put all these disclosures oh, in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if I put, like, for example, you know, like, so some, some people in our community are like drop shippers. So, mm-hmm. like, you know, and I, I tell them, I hey, put the shipping times so that you have, like, less issues, you know? Right. If it was all, yeah, conversion rates will drop. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, so those are the types of things, right? That mismanagement of expectations are things that cause the frustration with your customer. I'm not saying like, it's always bad because like there's a line that you can navigate through, but, but you got to understand what that line is to find a healthy balance of what you can do and you know, where you can push and where you can't. But if you realize that most of the disputes are about expectations, then what that means is it's all in your power and all in your control. What are you doing to set expectations with your customers how are, you know, what's, what's the timing, what's the product, what's the value, the perceived value, what's the experience of refunds, what's the experience of timing and delivery of the product, what's the experience of the unwrapping or the packaging. You know, I've seen guys who are selling, you know, $5 smartwatches or whatever, right? 
mm-hmm. uh, tracker, tra- tracker watches, whatever. And they're charging like 80 bucks for it on a, with a subscription, you know, to the app or whatever. And it's like, it comes in a little bubble wrap, you know, like little plastic wrap drop ship from China, <laughs> you know? And it's like, really, I paid $80 for this. Huh. And, it's, and it's this, this expectation of what they're going to get. But if you have that same product and you put it in some nicer packaging, yeah. something that feels a little more substantial, the value of what's perceived by the consumers mm. is higher. So, so thinking through what that experience is, yes, it costs you more, but if you're going to charge a premium price, then you better have the consumer believe you're delivering a premium product. Cause otherwise that disconnect, that mismanaged expectation is going to lead to disputes, mm. refunds and chargebacks. So if you charge premium, if you deliver charge- premium, Deliver premium. Yeah. Such a good point. And it's really simple. Like some things you can do, like you can, like I have some other clients where they're, they push the line on um, things that help get higher conversion, but then they're really good about resetting that expectation through the email sequences, through the delivery. Right. So, so they're, they're being very proactive in communication. Yes. They got the sale. Now, if it's really not a good fit, um, can you get a refund? Can you, can you deal with that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, And so resetting that expectation, just like any, uh, it's 5.15, so it's not 6 o'clock yet. You know, I'm going to be home late for dinner. It's probably going to be closer to 6.30. No problem. Thanks for letting me know. Dinner's not getting cold. <laughs> Everybody's happy, right? Very good insights. So how do you typically help merchants? Like, how do you, like, who do you work with? Is mm-hmm. there, like, a minimal criteria? Okay, so, for example, businesses of this size and higher, we typically can help the most, uh, or kind of, like, what do you... Yeah. Um, so here's the thing. Most of the time I, I've been in this space and I have most of my clients from relationships, right? So we, we connect and if I can help you, it's a relationship we build. And so anytime I have somebody who's made a connection to me from a, a relationship that I built, I'll spend time with them. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter to me if they're just starting up, they've never been in business before. Can I help them? Can I give them insight into how to be successful? Mm-hmm. And if I can help that because of the relationship, like I will invest that all day long. Makes it hard to manage sometimes from a time perspective, but, yeah. but I value the relationships that I have with people. And so a recommendation or referral from somebody that I have a relationship with, I realize that that's a reflection on them. And so if I treat that recommendation or referral poorly, then you know it, it reflects poorly on the person that I have a relationship with. And I don't want to do that. I wouldn't want that to happen to me. And I don't want to do that to other people. So I so if somebody's, you know, a recommendation or referral, personal connection, I will go out of my way, spend as much time as I can to help them and do whatever, you know, whatever I, however I would want to be treated in that circumstance. Um, just because that, that's my makeup. That's how I like to, to roll. But, um, you know, who do I, who can I really help, you know, from that perspective? Because that's what I would like to focus on too, is like, where can I add value? And if somebody's just kind of starting out, I point people to Stripe and PayPal all the time. Um, cause it's easy to start out and get going and, you know, there's low barriers to entry, all this stuff. But when you hit probably about a hundred thousand in sales a month, yeah. 75 to a hundred thousand a month or more, I think at that point, it's probably a good idea to begin to look at your own merchant accounts. Um, cause they'll pay for themselves and you can begin to do things that you may not be able to do with, with PayPal or Stripe. Mm-hmm. And if nothing else, if nothing else, you have some, re- you can set up some redundancy systems and structures that give you diversity so that you're not, you know, if, if PayPal were to shut down or Stripe were to shut down or hold funds or whatever, you can pivot and it doesn't shut down your business. You're not completely um, restricted because the time you need to set those things up is not in the crisis. It's before the crisis happens. Yeah. You told me like 20 or 30%, right? Like that's, I think it's a good idea because if, you know, taking, if you lost 20 or 30% of your capacity to process sales, Mm -hmm. it's not going to put you out of business. It's going to, You've got to adjust to that, but it's not, it's not game ending. Right. But, um, but if they've got a hundred percent and they shut you down, that's, that's game over, right? You've got to scramble and the time to scramble is not when you need it because you're in a bad position. You're not able to negotiate. You're trying to get anything you can up. Yeah. Um, it's a terrible place to, to try to negotiate from. And you don't care because you just want to get the capacity to take sales again. I so I think it's so much it's so much wiser, especially as you get to about, you know, 50 to 75,000, begin to think about it. 75 plus to hundred plus. I think you, you absolutely, it, it would be, 
not, there's a word I'm looking for, but it, it just, it just wouldn't be wise not to have some redundancy in place, some ability to diversify a little bit, even a little bit. And we'll have, by the way, guys, we'll have the, the contact or like the form that you can use to apply um, and connect with, with Travis, with his team. Uh, if you if you're at that level, like 50, 75, hundred thousand dollars per month in sales and you're looking to scale, but to scale, you have to, you need to have the diversity. You cannot be reliant on anything like one, right? Yeah. Add, yeah. You know, one ad account, one merchant account, and um, that will be very helpful. So there will be a form you can guys, you guys can apply and, uh, and see how um, Travis and, and his team can help you out. Um, Travis, like probably like last thing I want to ask, like what is the thing about like PayPal, right? Because mm-hmm. The, 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 the thing with PayPal, for example, because we have some people in our community, you might, you might know better, like, you know, better from, like, from your perspective because you're very like, uh, connected and you see so many different perspectives. But like, sometimes PayPal would, like, even for, for like, legitimate companies, right? Mm-hmm. PayPal would pl- put a hold on your account, Right yeah. or just or just shut down your account and we have had um, people in our community, you know, like basically they, they would have a hole. Let's say like hundred thousand um, dollars there. Like the hold would happen, right? Mm-hmm. Like one hundred eighty days, which is I mean bad for it's, people. Hor- it's horrible, right? But like what happened yeah. at the end of the that like hundred eighty days is that PayPal would sometimes not every time but sometimes like would pay like from your account to themselves, to PayPal, $100,000. And they would say it's because you use like unacceptable business practices, something that you have signed somewhere in the contract. Like that happens and that really happens. And like, um, I know, like, I don't know if you know the guy, Chris Mead, like Meaty or Mead, like he's, uh, they have this like, um, uh, volleyball, but like not regular volleyball, but like two side volleyball, four side volleyball game. Okay. Cross net, cross net. Um, I don't know if you're familiar. Um, very, very mm-hmm. cool guy. I interviewed him um, some time ago. Cross net. And um, basically, he had like, I mean, they run like legitimate company. Uh, so their products are like, so in Walmart, okay. Dick Sporting Goods. Oh, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, like he posted on his LinkedIn, hey, it's just horrible, you know, the good reviews, you know, and mm-hmm. a hold of like $100,000 just because they were like, he has like a single, like a big audience on LinkedIn. I think PayPal, like someone from PayPal, like reached out, they didn't want to like have a mess, you know, mm-hmm. and they kind of like sorted it out. But for other people who don't have that, you know, who don't have that like influence, who don't have that kind of like reach, then it could be just, you know, game over. So what yeah. is it that? I mean, that's the thing. Um, it's, if you don't have like that type of relationship where you can, you know, address that or have somebody where you can talk to you to figure it out. Yeah. You know, that's, it's hard, right? Like where do you, where do you go? How do you set that up? And the thing is like with that, a lot of times with PayPal, the challenge is like people just don't have the ability to to reach out to somebody and actually talk to figure out what actually happened, what's their concern. You know, everything's done through email or ticketing system. So it's really, really difficult to, to just figure out what's going on. You know, in that circumstance, like there's always going to be some sort of concern. Obviously they like, they have a concern. And so a lot of times like they'll ask for information, they'll ask for delivery confirmation. They want to make sure customers are getting the transactions. Sometimes they, you know, it's, Again, like think of them from like a risk bank perspective. Like if they see a lot of like either really crazy growth or high growth and on sales yeah. or erratic growth, like you have a bunch of sales and then no sales and then a huge spike of sales and then no sales for them. That looks so risky because if there's anything that happens, then like if you have a steady business and if there's concern, they can divert a little bit of funds or have a reserve and they've got some money in, the, in place to protect themselves. If you go out of business or something happens. But if they have this huge spike and they didn't hold any money from that, and then there's nothing, they have no opportunity to put a place on hold or do anything. And so from them, that spike or that volatility can be really risky from their perspective because mm. it's they like the real steady, real so, stable. So, so again, right, I see how you think, you think like what they want, right? Like what mm-hmm. do people on the other side of like 
risk managers, right? Like who's <laughs> kind of like, you know, who's responsible for that? Who don't want to be screened at? Right. Um, and that's why, like, again, like if you can get a hold of somebody or even in your email communication, Hey, it looks like you guys have some questions about our business. How can we help you address whatever you need? You know, taking a friendly tone like that and to try to, and yes, it's a pain in the butt, like stop your business. We're not going to give you money. Um, and go get this, a bunch of data for us, Ugh. <laughs> but, but you can't run your business without being able to get paid. So it, it becomes really important. And yes, you can get pissed about it. And yes, it's like, it's a valid hundred percent valid to be pissed about somebody holding your money, mm-hmm. but people don't usually act completely irrationally. <laughs> not usually sometimes, but not usually. And so what it means is if something's happening, it's an indicator that there's a concern or there's something that needs to be addressed or resolved or, or just fortified from their perspective. So whatever you can do to help them do that, where they can just tick the box and pass the file. Okay. And, and, and look at it that that's part of your job or your role when something like that happens better. If you can work with somebody who already understands your business and understand how you're going to run. Um, and from there, be able to put together a plan that, make sure that everybody's in line. So when you deliver exactly as you expect, Hey, we're going to have, we're doing a big launch. We're going to have a hundred thousand sales in two days. And then we're going to do nothing <laughs> for, yeah. for a month. But if you're proactive and you're like, Hey, we have a big launch coming up. If you have any questions, Maybe you know, let us know. Contact with someone, right? Like in the, in the company. So then at least you can start building that relationship, have someone like to kind of like notify about those changes. Right. And that, that's another reason why I really like having the relationship aspect of, of this role that I get to play with clients because they let me know something's going up on or the planning. I, I love being involved in the planning because in the planning, there's plenty of opportunities to say like, here's things that we can make sure these are things that you should be concerned about that we should make sure to address and have a plan in place because then you can be success. You can be set up for the success mm-hmm. and, and manage or mitigate your downside or your risk. But if you're in the midst of it, now you're scrambling. And a lot of times I see people in the midst of chaos making really bad decisions because they're just trying to get out of the chaos. Mm, so and, and many times much, they make bad, worse decisions, right? So pretty much, yeah, the best, what you're saying is it makes so much sense. It's pretty much the best decision to take care of the like merchant accounts, um, probably PayPal as well, is when everything is good. Like not When it's now. great, that's the perfect time. Right. And yes, it's like, why do I, make, why do I want to add complexity to everything's working so smooth? And I, I get it. It works smooth until it doesn't. Um, and that's not the place you want to be in. So I, I'm always a big fan of having redundancy, especially if you begin to scale your business or you plan on continuing to scale your business. business. Having, having a growth plan in place is huge. Um, I love spending a little bit of time with clients talking about like, okay, let's talk about where you're at now on your business. And okay, great. What are your concerns? How we help you? you know, look at all those things. But then I love getting into like, like, where do you want to be in a year? Like, what's your plan? Where are you, where are you trying to get? Mm. So you might be doing a million dollars a month, but you want to be at 12, 12 million in a year. Okay. Well, let's figure out how to, how to position you to be successful there where you're not going to have stupid reserves or crazy high reserves or funds held or any of that kind of stuff that's going to hinder that growth. Like let's, let's begin. And then I'll even talk to clients about like, well, let's talk about what your financials look like to support that growth. Because if it's, if it's essentially risk that a processor is looking at their line of credit kind of mentality, how do we say, hey, this is a good loan package. This is a good package. You want our business. We're really low risk. Um, here's how we're doing all the things that you might be concerned about. And here, you know, here's all the things we've done to protect ourselves to, and to handle that growth and that scale. And so I'll write out you know, three, four page executive summaries to, on a package where it's like, here's this company. Here's all this information. Here's their story right? Here's where they're going. Here's their financial, like, here's the package. Um, and why I think we should do it, why it's great. And, and a lot of people won't spend the time to do that, but it, but when you can paint that picture, they have so much, all their questions are answered. You know, they, they have so much more confidence in being able to get the, the deal done because they have a nice little package wrapped up to, to really understand what their business is, where it's going, what they're doing, how they're managing risk, how they're monitoring stuff, what they're doing, with customer service preventing chargebacks, fraud tools, like all that kind of stuff. Like you can put together a really solid package to, to make it the best case you can. And when you do that, you know, it, it answers all their questions and then they don't need anything else. That's awesome. So yeah, guys, if you, uh, 
again, like if you're like 50, 75, 100K per month, maybe more already. Maybe you're already yeah. doing some good volume and you want to diversify. You want to have some good processing and also like just good relationship like with a real like person, <laughs> you know, with that you can contact them. Um, you should be a forum, reach out to Chavez, see if, you know, that's a good fit for both sides. And But, you know, man, I mean, so many people recommended you, you know, so many people say, hey, Travis is your guy. So, uh, you know, you're my audience. So I, I'm sharing with you like some very, very valuable uh, context. So Travis, thank you so much for making time for this. I know you're a busy man. You got it. And uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, drop them below. If you want to apply to, to work with, with Travis, with his team, there should be some form or link below. And um, yeah, thank you so much for watching. I got a lot of value. I, I got a lot of like kind of like <laughs> things that, yeah, I probably knew kind of like at the end, you know, but now like, boom, like reinforce. And then like now they're back to the surface and <laughs> there are things that I need to do from my side for our business. So thank yeah. you for sharing, Travis. Appreciate your time, Alex. It's yeah. been a lot of fun. Thank you very much.